Hello and welcome to uh, the first uh, event in a series of webinars and chats and discussions uh, that we're hosting here at Mark Forged to think about the relationship between supply chains, what's happening in the world today around us, and the use of additive uh, technology. And so we'll just, we'll wait a minute as everyone is jumping in here. We, I know we have a lot of interest uh, in this opening panel and we have a great set of folks uh, joining together to help us talk about these topics. Um, our, uh, I'm gonna be your moderator. So I'm the VP of marketing here at Mark Forge. So I'm gonna try to keep the discussion going. Um, we have a great set of people, uh, lots of different industries, lots of different experiences. Um, during uh, this panel, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them via the Q&A, and uh, we'll try to either cover them while we're talking or at the end. So please uh, give us feedback. We'd love to hear what you want us to talk about uh, throughout the course of uh, the next hour. Uh, our general agenda for today, um, we're going to start by thinking a little bit about the history of how change happens in industrial settings. Um, we're going to get a chance to talk uh, and hear from Greg, uh, the CEO of Mark Forged. Um, we're going to introduce this great panel. We're going to have a, an awesome discussion, uh, and then we're going to have some time at the end for Q&A. Um, for those of you who may not be uh, as familiar with Mark Forged, um, we're a company based in the Boston area. Uh, we create uh, the Digital Forge, which is an additive platform for industrial use cases. It consists of 3D printers. Uh, software and materials that all work together. And the goal is to be able to create a wide variety of industrial parts for all kinds of issues up and down uh, supply chains and manufacturing settings. Um, we have the world's largest industrial fleet of 3D printers. Um, so uh, around the world, we have more than 12,000 of these all connected together. Uh, and we've printed over 10 million parts uh, off the Digital Forge over the last uh, seven years uh, since we founded the company. And um, when it comes to the question of supply chains, really the idea is we wanna make it easier uh, and smarter to create parts, but that's just the beginning. Uh, we know that a, a part solves a problem and that when you solve lots of problems, you begin to transform your business. And so that's what we wanna talk about today. How can we use technology like additive uh, and other forward looking technologies to help us better respond to the problems we face uh, every day uh, on the manufacturing floor? Um, just when we think about supply chain, I kind of want to tee this up. Um, we're going to talk a bit about what's been happening over the last four or five months and how this has led into some of the changes that we're seeing. However, I want to make clear that the trends that are causing manufacturers to think about changing how they optimize their supply chains have been happening for a long time. Um, these are pre-existing trends. Uh, we've probably seen them for more than a decade. And they're all around how conventional supply chains can weigh us down. Um, oftentimes it can be slow and expensive, especially when you need to get certain unique and custom parts into your production lines. And so every step of the supply chain introduces uh, complexity and reliance on other parties, which can make it difficult to respond to business opportunity and to build the uh, agile type of business that we're all looking for in today's environment. And so that's what we're going to hear about today from our panelists. When we think about the history, though, like there is something special or magical, I think, happening right at this moment in time. And so I always look back to history to try to understand where we are today. And when you look at sort of the last great industrial revolution, which was sort of the electrification of factories and the creation of a modern assembly line, we should note that this didn't happen overnight, right? Revolutions don't just happen in an instant. They take many years. And so when it came to electricity, electricity was invented in around 1880, but it wasn't until about 1919 or 1920 that more than half of the machinery in a factory was actually powered by electricity and not steam. And this inflection point or shift, which you can see uh, on the graph on the left is a sort of when that tipping point happened. And then on the right is sort of the giant gains in productivity that really we credit with building the modern world. And we say uh, the industrial revolution of the last century. That tipping point, when we see that giant massive growth in productivity 
came right at the end of the 1918 pandemic. And now, I don't want to make the claim that pandemics cause revolution. Instead, I think what's very interesting here is that pandemics are moments of systematic human disruption. You can kind of think of it a wave that rolls over everything that we do. And we, we're all living this, right? Um, oftentimes, the term supply chain is a thing you might run into when you're in university, but you don't really run into it in the everyday world, right? It's kind of an arcane topic. It's something that economists talk about. Over the last four to five months, we are all thinking about supply chain just as normal consumers, right? We go to the store, the things that we expect to find there aren't there. Uh, I, I'll note that this morning uh, is uh, you know, Apple's big uh, sort of fall event. And for the first time in many years, they're not announcing a new iPhone. And the reason is, is because their supply chain has been disrupted. They've not been able to bring their new iPhone to market. This is the world's most advanced uh, electronics manufacturer, uh, unable to bring a product out on the time scale that they want. And so the point I want to make isn't that the pandemic is going to cause waves of change, but that this could be a tipping point. And so what I want to talk about with the panel today and learn about is what's been happening in your businesses? What have you seen and where do you think this is going over the next couple of years? And to start, uh, we have Greg Mark, who is the CEO and uh, founder, co-founder of Mark Forged. And so Greg, uh, th this is a, we haven't even had a chance uh, to sync on this question. So I'm going to throw this one off the top, but um, I don't, I, I, you, you tell a great story about how when you started Mark Forged, you didn't even really know what a supply chain was. That certainly wasn't the thing that you were thinking about, you know, seven years ago when you set out to create an industrial 3D printing platform. And so my question to you is, you know, as you were growing up to become uh, a sort of an entrepreneur and thinking about your future and as you've been running this business, what does it feel like to actually realize now that, that perhaps in, in addition to being a uh, technology entrepreneur, you are actually a supply chain entrepreneur? Uh, what does that feel like? How have you thought about that? And uh, could you have predicted we'd be here seven years ago when you started this company? That's a, that's a big question. So the, uh, it's interesting. I think that uh, supply chains have gotten, exactly you said, have been more top of mind. You know, prior to Mark Forge, I worked in manufacturing. We made, uh, we manufacturing electronics in, in China. We manufactured things in the, we had some parts of it in the US, like, you know, we were kind of global in that capacity. But the, the, original, the original goal for Mark Forge was to make high strength end use parts, right? And then to, and to bring down the cost to basically make metal and carbon fiber parts at a, you know, a fraction of what they were, what they were uh, costing before to be able to get that into the hands of, of uh, every engineer and designer. We didn't, you know, if you, if you asked me uh, seven years ago, would we print a quarter million NP swabs uh, because there's supply chain disruption on swabs for a pandemic, I would have like uh, laughed. Right. So the, uh, you know, we, we create like uh, extremely high strength parts. And I'm actually the panel you have today, if you guys don't know these people and you will by the end of this, this is one serious panel of like uh, hardcore manufacturers. And most of these people, when they use Mark Forge printers, they're making, they're taking advantage of high strength, like uh, really awesome uptime. They're doing serious industrial stuff, okay? Because of a supply chain shortage, we took all these printers that are capable of making like the most robust industrial parts in the world, and we printed plastic sticks. We printed a quarter million plastic sticks because it was a children's hospital in San Diego that ran out of plastic sticks and uh, kids were getting COVID, right? And so there was this, so we totally pivoted a 40 printer fleet, got a FDA certified in about like uh, three weeks, came up with a design with, a, with another company in a few more weeks and we popped out a quarter million swabs. Right, and then we did a uh, we did a bunch of PP as well, so uh, face masks, right, face shields, and uh, we worked with uh, an open source group to design these. We popped them into a bunch of customer uh, customer accounts, airdropped them in, and custom Markforge customers all over the world started printing PP for their local uh, hospitals. It was a beautiful thing. So it's so papish. If you if you go back to the beginning, did I expect that we would have this fleet of thousands and thousands of printers uh, all over the world? 
printing uh, printing parts to to fix supply chain disruptions? No, that was like a very pleasant surprise. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's been uh, it's been a great learning opportunity too, right? So obviously, uh, you know, we we make printers and platforms, but we've been learning so much about kind of modern supply chains from all the customers we're going to hear about today, um, and it's really I think helped us as a company think about what areas of technology we should develop next. Um, let, what me, are some let, me, let me add one interesting thing. Something we noticed in this whole process that was totally unexpected when we made the. Uh, the first printers, we made them lightweight and transportable for basically DOD usage, right? What happened in this pandemic actually, we, because we can see material printer usage in real time because we have a connected fleet. We usually have a drop of material usage over the weekend, right? People go home, they don't use their printers as much. What happened because of COVID is people took their Mark Forge printers home. So it's the same, the same reason that the Marines uh, have deployed our printers around the world. Mark Forge customers all around the world were taking X7s, Mark IIs, like industrial printers home and running them at home to the point where our weekend drop massively reduced. All of a sudden people were printing parts on the weekend because they could take this industrial fleet and, and move them, right? It was, it, was another, it was totally unexpected and totally awesome. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's always exciting to see um, what people can do with such a flexible tool, right? So like a lot of times we wouldn't be able to predict, uh, but it's been, it's been really neat to see people continue to manufacture during this time period. Um, so I want to introduce our panelists so that we bring a couple more voices uh, into our conversation here. And so we have representatives from um, four really fascinating uh, global companies, uh, Siemens Energy, Dana, Worth and Bestus. Uh, and I want to basically uh, introduce um, each um, member of the panel uh, and kind of get a little bit of background on sort of um, your perspective, um, where, where, where you've been working, what you've been working on, uh, and um, what you've been doing in Additive over the last period of time here. So I'm going to start with uh, Cliff, who is the director of the Innovation Center for Siemens. Uh, and is uh, sitting in a really awesome environment. Uh, I love uh, your robot behind you there. Uh, Cliff, would you, would you give us a little bit of background uh, on yourself and what you've been working on? Oh, uh, you're muted, Cliff. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. Um, Cliff Hatcher, work for Siemens Energy, um, the uh, general manager for the Innovation Center here. Um, basically, We've um, combined and, and put all the, the right resources, uh, equipment, engineers into one location to efficiently respond to our, our service business. Um, that being said, you know, we have a, a, a quite a bit of Mark Forge printers to be able to do adaptive machine, to be able to do additive machining, uh, to quickly do prototypes, to prove out things and uh, We've been fully operational during the COVID period. Uh, we've had 46 engineers here working safely, uh, creating some PPE for local hospitals, our, our, our service facilities. Um, and it's, it's made possible being able to, to do uh, additive manufacturing on the March 4th systems. Um, we, we, we use those every day. They're, they're constantly running. Um, it allows the engineers to be creative. It doesn't limit their design process. Uh, in the past, we would have to, you know, shrink things down to one design because of machining cost. Uh, but with this, it, it gives the engineers freedom to test out different things. And uh, it's been very successful for us. We're able to quickly come up with prototypes, quickly test them out, uh, and then from there go into a, a final design with, a, you know, with traditional machining like CNC and things like that. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Cliff. Uh, and uh, I want to introduce uh, next uh, Pontus uh, Johansson, uh, who uh, I used to work with Cliff and is now based in Europe. Uh, and uh, Pontus would love to hear uh, sort of some background from you. And I also know that um, one of the things that you've been working a lot on recently in Europe is sort of service bureaus and their role and how they can help uh, fix problems. So I'd love to hear some background from you. Yeah, so Siemens Energy, of course, we have a long background with additives, uh, actually longer than Greg's history, I would have to say. But uh, since my, my role in this has been since 2014, when we got the task here in, in the Siemens Energy location in, in Sweden, 
to actually try to build an industrialized environment for laser powder bed fusion additive. So, so that's how I got fully engaged into how do we actually industrialize additive technologies and actually go from this R&D and prototyping environment into actual, actual real life production of end use parts, right? So, so that journey has been happening across Siemens Energy, uh, not just here then, but also as, as you said, I was working with Cliff over in Orlando for a number of years. So, and <clears throat> what we have in Siemens beyond making our own end use parts, whether it's turbine components in, with, with metal or tool and fixed ring and, and, and clever gadgets on, on your uh, uh, Onyx based uh, printer so far and, and uh, investing in how to use the metal X. There are uh, possibilities as we see it within Siemens Energy to go external, right? So we have, we think, with the experience we've built in terms of how do you industrialize and make parts, uh, real advanced parts, just like Cliff is doing. Could we sell that externally? So here in Europe, we have within Siemens Energy some, some third party possibility to go to external customers as well and help them and support them, whether it's for aerospace or uh, I think we have some engagement in, in, in racing equipment so it's we do that as well simply because we think we have a good understanding on how to industrialize the additive challenge because uh, yeah, for us right seeing the supply chain is exactly that how do you go from this cool gadget this cool design to actually make it over and over again in a quality assured manner i think that's for us one of the things we really have to work on how do we genuinely industrialize the end part and, and get that confidence in, in the continued use of it so I'm not sure how many of you are aware of, this, of the energy business itself, right? But when we make turbine components, they will be at full utilization, 100% load for four to five years. And that basically means that we make a little gadget in metal that weighs two kilograms that, that, that brings about the same force as a Formula One engine for 30,000 hours straight. No interruption, no stop, no overhaul, no, you know, no nothing it's it's full power for for four years so it's we do make some extreme parts with additive technologies yes it's fun <laughs> that's awesome one i think it would be great to get into a kind of a, a additive og conversation so we'll see who's <laughs> who's who's our who's the oldest granddaddy of additive on the panel uh but two this idea that um really yeah a technology that i think was you know in an experimental phase for many years or being used for prototyping is now becoming used in a full industrial setting and, and what sets of applications that opens up i think that's something we're going to hear about today you know, as we can go after more of these industrial use cases with this technology, we can fix more supply chain problems, right? It just opens up that set of things that we can do with this. So it's awesome to see um, what you're doing to push the boundaries there. Um, I also, I wanna introduce uh, Terry Hammer, who's the VP of engineering for Dana. And I, what I love, so D Dana, um, and you'll give us some background, I'm sure you know, it's a, a hundred year plus company that's really finding ways of using new technology to kind of stay on the forefront. So I'd love to hear some background, Terry, from you and what you've been working on. Hey guys, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at in the world. Thanks for your time today. <clears throat> I do work for Dana Corporation. Dana makes automotive dry and light components uh, from everything from uh, golf carts all the way up to underground mining axles. We make uh, really axles, transmissions, and prop shafts is our, is our core market, as well as, uh, um, I'll say sealing and thermal management technologies. Um, Dana has uh, um, really been involved in additive since before I started. I started with the company in 93. Um, I remember the first day I came in uh, to the new office, we were making uh, prototype uh, um, cores of using um, paper layered, glued together, and then shaped uh, in an additive process all the way back then. So a rich history of additive within the company. Um, we obviously uh, um, have moved on to, I'll say, more higher technology additive with uh, um, items like the Mark Forged uh, system. Um, we have roughly a fleet of uh, about 25 uh, printers deployed globally around the world. Um, we have North America, South America, India, Europe, and Asia covered with the printers. So we do have a global network supported with the Mark Forged, uh, I'll say connected technology. 
um, the uh, we have been, uh, I'll say, uh, also using the printers to support the COVID activities, much like uh, um, everyone has mentioned here um, in support of the community. But we've also been using it to um, create uh, spare parts when equipment goes down. Um, the supply base has been heavily disrupted uh, in relationship to the ability to get spare components to keep our equipment running. Um, so very unique cases um, uh, around the world to utilize the equipment to um, make sure we're supplying our products to our end users. Um, I guess thank you all for your time today and look forward to the discussion. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Terry. Uh, and uh, I want to go over to um, AJ, uh, who is uh, at a company Worth, uh, who's a, a sort of a, a partner uh, and customer of Mark Forged and a company that's really focusing on thinking holistically around supply chain, some of the thorniest issues that uh, customers have to deal with and how to use new technologies to fix those. And so AJ would love a little bit of your background uh, kind of in additive, but also maybe where you see some of this going in the future and, and why Worth uh, has really decided that this is an area of technology uh, that you guys want to invest in uh, for the long haul. Uh, sure, so there's a little bit of background. Worth uh, is a 70 year old company. It's the world's largest industrial supply uh, company. And uh, with that, it's a very mature market. And a lot of times it's of course having great quality, uh, but it's more important to always be on time. Uh, because those components uh, hold you up just as critical as, for instance, a carburetor not being available, uh, just like a washer or nut and bolt. It can throw the same sort of uh, wrench into the works. And so for the majority of my career, I designed and implemented BMI programs from small woodworking cabinetry to multi-million dollar uh, multi-site facilities. Uh, and with that, um, about three years ago, we started using additive to help our customers save time and money, right? So I'm sure we'll talk about those various reasons, but you know, whether it's prototyping a part and taking it to production, now we add value there. Uh, we're more consistent. We have uh, less quality issues. We get ahead of things. Uh, or now um, being a Mark Forge reseller and being an integrator, right? So unlike the folks on the line who are true manufacturers, I'm really just uh, an enabler of manufacturing and try to sell my products through service. So we see additive as a, a, a short circuit in supply chain. And so instead of fight it, we're going to kind of uh, uh, get in front of it. Awesome. Uh, thanks, AJ. And uh, uh, the last member of our panel uh, is Jeremy Haight, who's a principal engineer uh, at Vestas. Uh, another company that's uh, very focused on uh, sort of uh, turbines. And uh, Jeremy, love to hear some background from you and also um, some of the distributed use cases that I know that you guys are working on uh, that are enabled by software. We'd love to hear a bit more about those. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Yeah, so a little bit about Vestas. Uh, we're the world leader in uh, wind turbine manufacturing. Uh, much like some of the other folks on the on the call, our, our company's pretty, uh, pretty long in the tooth. We've been around since the late 1800s. Uh, started as a blacksmith shop, actually. Uh, so I, uh, a little bit about me. So I, uh, I, I'm a lead partner in overseeing uh, the uh, industrial automation uh, workflow digitization and additive manufacturing in uh, wind turbine man, uh, manufacturing. Um, so we, a big part of how we've kind of learned to leverage the technology is really uh, uh, it, it, some of those stop gaps that you experience in supply chain, not only with, uh, you know, OEMs, spare parts, replacements, you know, being a global organization, um, a lot of our OEMs are overseas, uh, which equates to long lead times, high cost, um, and uh, uh, considerable downtime in our manufacturing processes if we can't get that machine, uh, machinery and equipment back up and running. Um, some of the other specific use cases we have, um, we've really started to uh, ingrain the technology in direct digital manufacturing. So um, some of our quality gauge tools, go, no, goes, you know, some of the atypical uh, use cases that a lot of other manufacturers use it for. 
uh, but we're also building up uh, partnering with MarkForged and uh, Worth to uh, digitize our inventory and create kind of a, uh, a connective tissue across the globe that uh, we can manage a digital workflow instead of a physical inventory. Awesome, and I think it's a, a definitely a topic we're going to delve into deeper. But I think you know, big big part of the promise of additive technology is bringing kind of the speed and the scalability of a digital workflow to this sort of world of physical manufacturing. And so I think that's a theme we're going to hear quite a bit about, and especially over this last time period um, when supply chains have been disrupted, when it some it's been difficult to get physical things where we need them. Um, perhaps some of these uh, digital advantages are, are what's driving sort of the inflection point that perhaps is happening now. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit, uh, so Terry, um, I know that, uh, you know, manufacturing during this time period has been quite challenging, I'm sure. Um, you know, uh, we haven't been able to access our facilities. Uh, sometimes people aren't available. Um, so I'd love to maybe just hear a little bit about what it's been like over the last couple months um, what are some of the creative things that you've come up with to help solve some of the problems you've run into uh, and has additive played a role there? Yeah, you know, the last couple of months have been truly uh, um, challenging, I think, for anybody in the industry. Um, being such of a global su um, supply um, base is, is it, the COVID has, I'll say, popped uh, supply issues around the world. Uh, um, every day. Um, we have really struggled to um, uh, find, I'll say, replacement um, supply base in relationship to um, India went dark. Of course, you couldn't get anything in and out of India for almost uh, six weeks. Um, they actually shut the ports down. So created unique situations where you had to redeploy um, your assets uh, to go find new sources in, in, I'll say, weeks instead of the normal corporate process of, of finding new supply bases in, you know, 90 days, six months type process. So um, very unique situations in relationship to how do we move faster. Um, and moving faster is really the key in this, in this, I'll say, environment today to be able to adapt and change. Um, obviously, um, I mentioned earlier um, some of the supply constraints in relationship to um, uh, whether it's tooling fixtures, machine replacement parts, so on and so forth. That was even worse than component supply because a lot of times that was considered non-essential um, to the environment. So the uh, spare parts manufacturing was not a essential go to work uh, um, companies um, type uh, um, situation. So we ended up in several positions where we had to come up with uh, um, a new supply base or come up with a way to make it internally. Um, and uh, we've obviously both on the, the standard production side as well as the additive side, um, came up, we actually implemented a process uh, where we had what we called the short list of, of no supply components. Um, so we came up with a, a process where we would actually go through and say, this is the shortage list for this day. Um, and what are the alternatives from supply base, who has the right equipment, or, and we actually implemented a can additive do it checkbox um, in the process. So it was a very unique uh, um, environment the last couple of months. Um, we had to think differently about how we were doing business and we had to come up with faster, more innovative ways to uh, um, uh, resource product quickly. And additive became a part of it. Yeah, I think very vivid, right? Like to have to deal with sort of um, <laughs> disruption from multiple angles uh, during this time period. Uh, and yeah, and there are probably many tools to be to be found, but I think that idea of speed, um, you know, responsibility or sort of responsiveness, like that that's one of the things that I think additive can promise uh, when you know how to use it, when you've learned how to use it. Um, Cliff, 
Um, I know you have an example, um, some of the early days, you guys were actually supporting some local hospitals um, using some of the additive printers you had. Um, can you walk us through just sort of what, uh, what some of those issues were and uh, what you guys were able to do to kind of help out in the early days of the pandemic? Definitely. Um, when the early stages of COVID happened, I guess there was quite a bit of shortage of PPE equipment. Um, everything was going off the shelves, nothing was in the inventory. And so we got a lot of requests from local hospitals um, and also the, the, the fire departments within the, the Orlando area, uh, could we support in, in manufacturing? Uh, the team um, looked out what we could, we could make here from various designs, coming up with our own designs, uh, doing a lot of prototyping. And we ended up su uh, supplying, I think it was over, over 500 uh, face shields and, uh, and also some, some ventilator parts for the local hospitals um, using the, the additive manufacturing equipment the Mark IV systems had here. So, yeah. And, then, and that was within a couple of weeks. This wasn't something that, you know, we did over the entire period, but due to the shortage and then being able to, you know, having the engineers here and having the equipment, uh, we, were, we were producing a product set that we were handing over to the hospitals within weeks. It wasn't a long process at all. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something that uh, both Cliff and Terry had mentioned. I think the I think the phrase necessity is the mother of invention, yeah. right? So you know, Mark Forge pre-COVID, a lot of times we were used in factories to print parts for machinery that uh, was old, right? It's like, hey, here's a killer machine, but the manufacturer no longer makes this model, doesn't support it anymore, went out of business, something happened, and then through COVID, what we saw exactly as Terry mentioned is thousands and thousands of people all of a sudden printing parts for machines that are new, just the supply chain has been destroyed. Right. Right, exactly as Terry mentioned. So it's, it's, and, it's and really what, uh, one of the biggest things that we've seen, you know, you look at the companies that are on this panel, these are companies that have leaned into additive and, and are like uh, pushing it hard, right? And, the, and it's, it's a risk, right? What happens is you see these like, uh, the, I think papers, I think to your point in the beginning, pandemics uh, accelerate these things because the risk of not having the part on the machine is worse than the risk of trying it with a new technology. And you see that happen with pandemics and the companies that go through that and live through that and have a new tool that solves the problem, all of a sudden they come on the backside of this pandemic and it's like, hey, wow, we just qualified this, uh, this carbon fiber part in our most aggressive applications. Now we can think about using it in a lot more places than we ever would have used before. And that's that's why pandemics force these shifts. Yeah, pick, picking up on that, actually, a question for the whole panel, um, and anyone wants to jump in on. Um, yeah, how do you think the experiences that we've been having over the last couple months uh, are going to influence the future? Um, how do you think supply chains will, will change post COVID? Like, do you, do you already see some trends? Uh, any anyone with some ideas here that want to <laughs> step out and predict the future? Go ahead, Jeremy. Well, you know, going to Greg's point, um, you know, we we definitely saw a shift in uh, embracing newer types of technologies, um, at least internal Avestus. You know, uh, before pre-COVID, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of interest in the industrial sector towards this technology, but it's always kind of fallen into two primary buckets, either unobtainable due to cost or, you know, kind of that that maker maker space, right, where it's kind of a novelty. Um, and that's, that's what's been kind of great about this experience is, you know, we've been able to, you know, kind of by necessity, uh, we've been able to demonstrate internally and externally that, hey, this is a, this is a real, this is a real tool for manufacturing, right? We can leverage that to keep our production lines running. We can leverage that to supplement tooling or uh, jigging or fixturing, which we otherwise couldn't have gotten, which would have stifled our production and output. Um, so yeah, I, I really do think that a lot of uh, a lot of the classical industry is is going to completely be revolutionized by COVID plus additive and digitization of uh, of the workspace. Yeah, and for, from us, we're we're seeing a, a bigger push to find local vendors, to find vendors that um, maybe not necessarily affected by the pandemic. So. There is the big push, you know, and, and as you do that, you, you do different qualification processes, different fixturings and things like that 
Um, and we're finding that added manufacturing helps in, in, in those processes, specifically fixturing and things like that for other um, manufacturing technologies. Yeah, I, I think that every company, you know, businesses are profitable in a million different ways, right? So there's a lot of ways to approach it. But I think one thing and a question by David that got posed was, um, there was a lot of fixed, extremely rigid documentation, right? When supply chain was stable and not a ton of surprises. And everybody's been jumping through hurdles and breaking SOPs and making stuff happen in companies as mature as ours, right? So uh, the guys on the phone, I'm sure, have the same experience. So what I think it is, is more of a lesson that you have to be ready uh, for uh, a lot of volatility, but you know, you still want to take advantage of buying some parts in the most effective manner, right? Which is if you have a super reliable source and it's a part that 100,000 units, it's probably not there for additive, right? I think the key is, is having an additive solution where you have as much rigidity, but you have flexibility because now you have this kind of manufacturing autonomy to turn around parts at a whim. Um, and be a little more of a suspension bridge, right? So have enough bend in your supply chain standard operating procedures so that if things go haywire, you don't break, you have enough flexibility to react. And I could just, you know, a second that and the way we try to work on it in a systematic manner now is, is, is to see it as a supply chain risk management, meaning, you know, of course, yeah, we want to buy the cheapest part that's out there, absolutely, but if that means we can't support our existing customer base with spare parts, it, that's just unacceptable, right? So it's, it's this balancing act between, uh, say, consequence and uh, and uh, in, in the risk sense, right? It's what's the consequence and, and how can we mitigate it? And what's it worth to have a mitigation in place? Being a second supplier or a, you know, alternative additive solutions or a quick ramp up, meaning that, Worst case, we could probably do something with additive that allows us to, to do a decent replacement. So it's just the, a larger view on how to do risk management in our value chains. Um, I can't say we have a fixed solution for it, but it's something we're absolutely reviewing and, and considering how to manage this as we move forward. And, and I mean, it's not just COVID, right? It's, we've had it before. You, you have a, a key supplier that has a fire in their inventory location and it screws everything up for, for a number of months. So, so it's, but being of course in a pandemic environment right now, it's, it becomes more critical to figure out and, and think about these plans because it's, it's been a long time now that where, where a lot of our supply base is being interrupted to some extent. So it's not just that one supplier that suddenly has an incident somewhere, it's, it's across the line and it's challenging. Well, Pontus, I think, I think exactly the fact that it's across the line has made the world more open to alternative solutions. Yeah. If you have a supplier and it's like, okay, we Siemens have a supplier and they had a fire in a factory, your customer doesn't want to hear that, right? It's like, that's, just, that's, a, that's yeah. an internal problem. If yeah. the whole world supply chain is disrupted and everybody's looking for a new idea, it's like, hey, let's, let's talk about this new idea together and like figure out like, yes, there's, there's risks, but how do we make this work? Yeah. Right. And we've seen Absolutely. a lot of that across the board. Yeah, so it's not this one big event anymore. It's, it's the, the multitude of tiny events or tiny disruptions that is new to us. Uh, AJ, did you have something you wanted to add there? No, <laughs> sorry. Oh, we got <laughs> smart folks, I think they got it. <laughs> yeah, Terry, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, in the end, I, you know, I, it's, it's about speed and flexibility, right? Uh, and the, unique thing here was additives biggest uh i'll say uh, or one of the biggest things about additive is speed and flexibility and, and how it enables it uh it is not a, a a solution for everything by any means at this time yet but uh it uh speed and flexibility became the key to success in in this short period and really um speed and flexibility really should be adopted every day in the, in the business practice so um, it has accelerated the need to be even more um, flexible with more speed, um, but uh, a unique opportunity to, to drive technology based upon need. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, a great example or the sort of the sweet spot of this technology uh, overlaps with kind of the, the world that we're living in uh, to create a real, real urgency to adopt this. Um, there's an interesting question here and I wanted to pick up a bit on also what Pontus was talking about, about there being a balance, right? So, um, you know, I think it's easy a lot of times with new technology to kind of take in, uh, you know, all or nothing approach, right? Like the whole world will either become additive or, you know, traditional manufacturing will completely change. And I think as we're hearing, it's always a balance. It's always a blend. It's using the right tool and the right technology for the right problem we're trying to solve. I mean, that's, that's the point of engineering to begin with. Um, but there's this interesting question from an audience member um, about sort of the trade-offs or, or, or the dichotomy from sort of the traditional ways that we have built things uh, and we've built up many years of experience. So we have a great value in documentation, repeatable process, uh, the ability to automate because we've been doing it for so long. But today we see this sort of um, the advantage of flexibility and the need to sort of respond in the moment to disruption. Um, could the panel talk a little bit about uh, how you balance those two things, sort of as you think about sort of the traditional ways you build all the steps we use to qualify, to certify, um, versus some of the things we're doing in the world of additive. What are some ways that you've been using additive technology uh, in an industrial setting and what have you had to do to make it work? I mean, if the, as you look at it, is new tools come into production all the time. It could be software, it could be hardware, um, could be the material, is, to the point of the panelists is you don't replace 99% of your components with a 3D printed alternative. But the 5% of products that are extremely exotic, low run, require high end tool, whatever that may be, that's what you replace it with. The, and then some people will 5%, why am I, what do I care? And you go, you care a lot because that 5% is the majority of the parts and widgets you have to pay attention to because everybody pays attention to the SKU that you spend 400 grand on a year. Everybody knows where that part is. The part that you spend $40 a year on, right, to replace the uh, 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 sorting table or whatever it might be in your tool crib, you're not really paying attention to it. Your supplier's really not paying attention to it after you've had that table for 20 years. Um, but that's still a critical component. So I would say the biggest one is, is don't try to have a, a fish climb a tree. Don't use 3D printing for the right job, for the wrong job is it has its place. Um, and there's a lot of education that um, we have to do in the industry because uh, it's a new tool, you know, and if people don't know how to use it, then of course they're gonna try to print fasteners or ask us if we print fasteners all the time. And it's no, not really. That's not the, a good return on your money. You know, Dana's, Dana's kind of approached this as a uh, um, start small, think big. Um, we uh, really started from a let's make sure we deploy it uh, additive in a very safe and efficient manner. Um, obviously, most of our components uh, are on the road. So um, obviously, personal safety becomes critical. So we, we definitely started from a hey, let's um, use additive from uh, tooling fixtures, uh, machine components, uh, replacement parts mindset. Um, obviously, we've used the, uh, the mindset of rapid prototyping and technology development um, from additive. Um, but it was really about uh, first thing was getting, I'll say, the technology or the work stream embedded in the organization so that way you can take it from, I'll say the safe launch environment to a real production situation. Um, additive always starts off with, um, you know, it's, it's volume, size of the component and is the right material available against the uh, um, application you're using it for. So if you, so to speak, put, put it in the right box and know how to use the tool, um, within the organization, it becomes a very positive uh, tool for the organization. But really, the key, it, and I, you know, it was simple um, when we talked to our ELT um, members. It was, a, let's get started. Um, let's find a a, a path to um, enable 
um, engineers to take it to the next level. Um, so do nothing really was the no option. Um, you have to get it a, a system and practice and figure out how it fits within your, your organization. Awesome. Um, there's uh, another question here. And again, um, please feel free to keep bringing questions uh, into the Q&A box. We're, we're really happy to answer. We have about 15 minutes, so we'd love to get to as many questions as we can. Um, there's a question here from Angus um, around um, the uh, internal culture uh, and adaptability to new technologies. Um, is there been a willingness to adopt additive um, by those who have more traditional manufacturing mindset? And um, maybe here I'll, I'll turn to Pontus first. Pontus, you were talking a little bit about uh, earlier uh, before the panel started about how it's been hard to teach people how to use additive during this time period because we're not all together in the office. So, so yeah, maybe talk a little bit about what this kind of mindset shift needs. Uh, absolutely. So uh, look at mindset, right? And uh, we look at it here now and we're in, you know, a situation where we, in most Siemens Energy locations, you, if you're an engineer or if you, know, if you have a, a white collar job, we're not allowed to, to enter our, our shop floors anymore, or we may, but, but it, it requires risk release basically to enter there. So it's not something you easily go and help your colleague who, you know, you talk to someone and, and you know they have issues with fixed ring, they have some kind of challenge. That we can't really do now. So that's something we're working on. How do we support our, our colleagues across different sides of different buildings when we're not allowed to, to move around freely anymore? That is an issue. But, but it's also, I mean, this is a relevant question, COVID or not, because how do you create that willingness to change right and go from traditional solutions to, to new solutions? That, that's always reality. Uh, and for us, it's been, you know, it's, it's been a choice that we have to, to push this. We have to have people willing to go out on a limb and try stuff. I mean, it's, uh, it's what we heard before as well, right? We, not, not moving ahead is just a, not an option. You can't stand there and watch the future, the train to the future, leave the station and, and look at it. You have to be on board. So for us, it's, it's a question of doing all these learnings. It's about getting a, you know, a willingness to use additive, yes. But it's also not just to use the technology because that's kind of the, the R&D level. But when you're in a, in a point where you need to industrialize, it's the question is how do you get it into your PLM system? How do you properly define your part and the materials and the process around that so you can actually release a component over and over again into to, to final use? It's, I would say from a Siemens Energy perspective, we have a lot of, of issues around this, whether it's on, on the metal side or the composite side. These are challenging questions that, that we continue to work on. I mean, also, well, I'm very happy to be on this panel and you know, having suppliers like Markforge and others who are, at least to some extent, right, willing to, to look at how do we digitalize this? How do we do the material qualification? How do you make sure that qualification is valid over time? How do we continuously live up to the level of quality that our customers in turn expect from us. So it's, it's a lot of work, not just the, the challenge internally to, to adapt to this technology, but also how do we push that from the R&D community where we have originally been and, and bring it all the way through. So it's, it is a big challenge. I think it, it's something that really just requires a lot of hard and dedicated work communicating success stories, I think is one of the key things here is, you know, show that we've actually done a few really good things and keep showing that to people and get, build that curiosity. And everyone on, on the call, of course, or on listening, buy a 3D printer for your kids. <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were talking <laughs> in the panel just about, um, yeah, the, the uh, having a 3D printer uh, that, yeah, at home uh, with a kid who maybe uh, you know, isn't able to go uh, into a school environment is an amazing learning tool. Um, so pretty, pretty amazing to have. Does someone else have a, um, uh, something they wanted to mention around sort of the internal adoption, sort of building a culture of additive in your, in your organization? For us here, the, uh, the innovation center, it was us purchasing the equipment and then giving it to the engineers and said, print, print whatever you want, come accustomed to it, learn all the ins and outs of it, 
play with it. You want to make a golf club today? Make a golf club. Learn how to make it, right? I mean, that's how it is. And then what happens is that you, if you have uh, innovative people, they start to think about all the things that they can use that system for, and it organically happens within your 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 uh, your process, right? They start printing before going into machining. They start coming up with different ways to do it because they start seeing and and, and playing around with the systems about the, the, the endless possibilities of 3D printing and the, and the processes that we, that we normally do. So for us, we gave them the keys and we gave them the car and said, go drive it. And then, and then they, they adopted it. So. I, I, yeah, if I just may add to that, Radcliffe, because once we started using additive, and you make something in metal in additive and, and you can do these weird shapes, you can do this yeah. you know, organic structures for a new combustion system. And suddenly you need more additive because you, you can't do the final machining without having an additively done fixture because there's no way right. to clamp that crazy design. So it's, suddenly you, you're, you're on a roll, right? So one thing leads to the next and suddenly, you, you know, the designers start to realize that the freedom they have will it, it, force really, us into really, new technologies. It, it, it uh, closes that gap between the guys that are in manufacturing and the engineers, right? They're working together now. They're they're working on the printers together and, and, and coming up with new ways to do things. So it's it's a nice thing. Yeah, the, the theme of education and enablement, I can carry that on that it is something new is but I think everybody on the panel here, or I'm, I'm sure almost universally feels like they are uh, you know, advocates trying to spread the gospel and, and really and that's kind of what the role is, right, is um, until people ride in the automobile, they go, well, the horse is fine. Why do you keep coming to me talking about this automobile? I don't get it. And then you go, I'm telling you, this is going to be easier. I'm telling you, it will be easier. And then to your point is you, you show them, you know, uh, the impact to carbon footprint, the impact to global uh, trade routes and kind of how you can decrease your impact there. And now you're going, there's reasons beyond to that point, making a widget on demand or whatever um, is now you kind of get the impact that it'll have at scales, just like, you know, New York was under two feet of horse manure in the uh, late 1800s and, the auto, and they were, they were going to invest in barges to take it offshore and bacteria eating, uh, you know, man-made bacteria to eat it on the, the streets and stuff like that. But then the automobile came along and that no longer was an issue. And there's stuff like stock out, stuff like um, uh, uh, being attached and, and, and latched onto a vendor that doesn't service you right, that now you've got a technology that it gives you a lot more freedom. And just like the automobile, it's easy enough to use where you should probably take advantage of it, you know? Yeah, um, picking up there is sort of the questions around maybe, um, you know, reducing carbon footprint, thinking about sort of the, uh, the impact uh, of manufacturing these technologies. Um, I think it's a question here for Jeremy, um, but is it fair to say that the things we're talking about here today go well beyond the pandemic to, to larger systematic change uh, like carbon footprint and, and climate change? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that we've highlighted internally is, uh, you know, what, what does this technology leverage in terms of reducing our global footprint? Um, and I think one of the main advantages is obviously, you know, we're, we're consuming significantly less, uh, less energy in manufacturing, number one. Uh, number two, by eliminating the, uh, you know, kind of transcontinental or intercontinental supply chain, right? All of those logistical tons of CO2 that would have been expelled for that one part on our behalf is eliminated, right? We've internalized that. We can locally manufacture um, at point of use. Um, so yeah, there's, there's massive implications in reducing uh, carbon footprint with the use of additive. Awesome. You know, I want to touch on something that uh, AJ said, uh, and that's what Cliff and Ponte said, and what I've, you know, look, I have the unique advantage of getting to see like thousands of companies go through their additive journey. And I can tell you there's like, uh, there's a starting point, which is some combination of like concern, fear, and uncertainty which then transitions into like childhood exuberance, right? So when people start the additive journey, it's like, oh man, is this printer gonna work? How's this gonna be? Are people gonna hate it? Da da da. Then they start using it, they find applications that are like, holy crap, does like, it reinvigorates their like uh, joy to be an engineer, right? It's like all of a sudden, like, uh, like Cliff was saying, oh wow, you can design this new shape, 
you can hold this new way, I can da da da. I've seen people who are like, were manufacturing technicians on the assembly lines, who were now, for the first time in their life, were able to say, I really want to have this thing. And because it was so cheap to make it, they get that thing now. And all of a sudden, the line's moving faster. And so you have somebody who, for like 20 years, and I've watched this many times, 20 years they've had having ideas. And now for the first time, they get to actually put these ideas into practice and they feel great about it. And by the way, the line runs faster, right? It's like, uh, and we've seen this like time and time again, where it's this like concern, uncertainty, fear turns into excitement. Yeah. So um, we have about uh, five minutes left. And so I want to throw out uh, sort of a, a concluding question. And we have a bunch of questions here. Um, you know, we'll try to, we've tried to get to as many of them as we can. Um, if we haven't had a chance to, we'll try to follow up with you after the panel. We also have some panels coming up later uh, in the next couple of weeks where we can talk about these topics. But um, my, my last question for the panel comes from uh, Andrea in the audience. And um, basically this, this emergency is gonna finish sooner or later, uh, sooner hopefully. Um, some changes that have occurred in the supply chain during this emergency will stay here forever. Um, let me find the end of the question. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're throwing in lots of questions here. My questions uh, are going <laughs> up and down very fast. Um, what are some of the supply chain um, changes that we've seen during this time period that we think are going to stick with us? Um, what are some specific examples uh, that you have seen over the last couple of months that you think are long-term trends that are going to be here with us uh, for the future of manufacturing? You know, in the Dana side, it, you know, it, it, that need again for flexibility to consider multiple source. Um, uh, so you have a, uh, um, I'll say a, a backup um, I see changing um, from a landscape standpoint. Uh, um, the idea of single source may not uh, go quite as, as well in the future as it has in the past. So um, not only that, but uh, I'll say the idea of close to home, um, wherever your, um, I'll say site is or end user is also is going to change because uh, region to region, um, we've def definitely ran into different barriers depending on where you're at in the world. So I think uh, um, <clears throat> the idea of, uh, of closer to home manufacturing comes into play and, and backup to, um, plans uh, become much more uh, um, important in the future. Yeah, we just echo that from Siemens Energy side too. Um, we're definitely this this happened, and you know we're in a like you said, the you know, single source justification things like that is something that we will have to do more of a review on, and 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 have more of a local region type of uh, approach versus global. Yeah, I think also right not disagreeing at all, but how do you plan to quickly ramp up or qualify suppliers of advanced components? How, how do you, you know, can you through this digitalized future where, where your parts are defined in a different way than drawings and, and a gazillion of different documents supporting the drawing, can we define parts in a way that we can actually qualify and have them prove in, in a much faster way, right? So it's this, the, the speed potential, how do we, how do we live that with, with these new technologies that are coming? Yeah, I think, um, uh, like I said, is because there's just so many companies and you can do it so many ways is the thing I think I go back to is um, you find uh, great use cases for the printers you have on site and you pump parts out all the time that you know make you money and they're efficient, but you want to invest in that technology because if you have to turn on a dime and start making nasal swabs, that goes from pumping out those everyday parts in your tool crib to making nasal swaps now. And that doesn't happen. You talk about retooling, you talk about, you know, maybe it's a very specific piece of equipment for that gauge wire to run your part, whatever. Um, these boxes pivot on a dime. That's why Mark Forge went from lifting up, you know, 700 kilo overhead cranes to nasal swabs is because that machine gives you this capability there's not an inherent cost barrier to making either of those items right now. And so that's where I go is, is get a solid foundation for your investment, but where it'll pay for itself is when you do experience uh, 
some volatility and you're going to be able to react. That's when it's going to pay for itself on the day and not the year and a half year ROI you have on those maybe everyday parts um, that you can find. But yeah, I, th I think adopting some flexibility into a rigid infrastructure is something people will keep in mind going forward. Awesome. I think that's a great note uh, to end the panel there. Um, so uh, really, uh, I wanted to thank uh, everyone um, for their time this morning. I thought it was a really fascinating conversation. Um, obviously, this is a topic uh, that is still very uh, important and interesting to, to us here at Mark Forge, to the panelists. So we have a series of events coming up that I'd love to encourage the audience to join us for. Um, Next Thursday, uh, we are going to have a conversation uh, with Terry uh, around how Dana transformed their business with additive manufacturing. So that's going to be an awesome conversation to kind of go deep on a use case. Um, and then um, if you want to see all the different things that we have planned uh, or learn more about Mark Forge, please visit our website and check out uh, our events page for our uh, overall supply chain series. Uh, we have a series of events coming up with a bunch of different speakers. Um, we're going to kind of go deep as we can. Um, I know there's tons of interest from the audience today in your questions. So um, we'll try to follow up and please come to a future event. Um, this is something that is... Um, it is a topic that we're always thinking about. Um, you know, we, we make, uh, you know, a, a digital forge, an additive platform, um, but it's how you use this thing that it actually matters. Uh, how are people applying it to real problems in industry today? And we look forward to continuing this conversation with you uh, down the road. Thank you so much, and we'll talk soon.